Well, they scored. It's Grant who's got the goal from the free kick, and we're headed for extra time now, surely. Coming go! It is 2 0, and that now surely seals the K League title for John Wooden and Moses. You're listening to the K League United podcast, proud partner of Football Nation Radio. Hello? I'm going to say oh, Ryan Walters in an, in an undisclosed location, a traveling K League United bunker, and I am joined this week by Matthew Bins. Hello. Matthew, uh, I'm, well, it doesn't need to be a secret. I'm down on Jeju Island soaking up the ocean and all of the gloriousness that is down here. And for the folks watching live, that's why the top of my head's a little bit red. <laughs> I thought you'd be wearing a helmet, giving me your Instagram stories. You've been uh, cycling around everywhere. Ooh, scooter life on Jeju. That is the way to do it. Uh, for the folks that haven't been down here before, there's a UNESCO World Heritage Site out east known colloquially a sunrise peak i haven't been out there before because i've never made it out east but took a scant four hours from Saguipo, where jg united play which is where i've based myself obviously and uh took four hours to get out there on the scooter just stopping whatever sounded good on the way out there getting some good food island life it doesn't mm. suck I'm very jealous also caught up with bronco balan obviously and uh <laughs> of the two games that we went to together we did not go to Jeju United's 2-0 victory over Jumbo Kenley Motors, which you and I are going to talk about in this episode. We instead went to their 0-0 draw with Suwon FC. Yeah, probably the better of the two, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it was it was colder and no goals. So, <laughs> what a choice. Anyway, we are going to talk a little bit about that, but uh, we're talking about all sorts of things this week. Namely, ooh, that mug. That mug right there, Matthew Bins went for the Lion King, boys and girls. Uh, yeah, I've given up on K League and I've started going to musicals <laughs> instead. Uh, um, the two weeks ago, I went to. Um, uh-huh. I, uh, I uh, when John Book were losing points to Daegu, I went mm-hmm. to watch the tragedy that was Notre Dame, which you know, great. It was a great musical, great work, and all that. I. It was all in French, and the subtitles <laughs> were in Korean, and um, I couldn't keep up with the subtitles. And my French is uh, it's, well, it's not very good. I was going to use some French then to describe it, but I thought that's how bad my French is. I actually can't think of the French word for bad. But um, it was it was <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a very good. Music. And then yet yeah, this week, you know, John Book losing to Jeju. I thought, well, let's go and uh, reminisce about. Lee Dong Guk and uh, watch The Lion King and um, you know another great musical so that's basically it now I've given up on um, mm-hmm. John Book and I've just decided I'm gonna find more and more shows to watch oh I see Paul's watching live and he asked is c'est terrible yeah we oui. that sounds a little more that's it yeah Spanish but anyway let's let's not offend anybody else that we <laughs> haven't already Let's go ahead and start talking about what we're going to be talking about this week, which was which if you weren't able to watch live, then unfortunately, you're not going to know too much of what we're talking about for these AFC Champions League playoff matches because the highlights aren't out there. But we'll talk a little bit about that and more about the ACL playoffs. But the good news for K-League fans is that Ulsan Hyundai were able to see off Port FC and Daegu FC in grand fashion. With the golden god, as you refer to him sometimes, Cecina, mm-hmm. just just doing Cecina like things and saving their bacon there against Booty Ram United, a match that I had torn allegiances in. And then afterwards, we're going to hear from Paul Neat, who's watching now, but we're not having him join us. This isn't Twitter Spaces. It would be great if we could. But instead, we are going to hear his interview with Gangwon FC's Dino Islamovic, who ooh, shortly after this interview ruptured his Achilles. So this interview was done before that. And obviously we wish him all the best in his recovery. So it'll be interesting to hear what he thought of the season ahead when he was still going to be involved in the entire season, but who knows, he might be able to come back quicker than expected. And then after that, Matthew, we're going to do what we do on this show very often. You and I, we're going to talk about Jumbo Kendai Motors. Are you excited? 
not this time. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be ending a segment talking about Jumbook. Yeah. So. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, we also to it. <laughs> we also, as always, have the old G. Luis mailbag. If you didn't get your questions in already, please do so during the live show now in the comments, and we'll get to them as we go. And then at the very end of the show, in our returning segment, Matthew and I are going to give our picks for Survivor this week. Did you plan your pick already? No, I haven't. So I'm going to be planning live. Okay. And speaking of things happening live, the Jenum Dragons are playing right now, so that is definitely on in the background. We don't like going live when K-League games are on, but there, there's a very limited window these days of when K-League isn't playing. And so we are here as your accompaniment to the K-League 2 matches that are going on tonight. But before we can get into any of that, Matthew, there are all sorts of things going on on the interwebs that folks can check out if they would like to. Yeah, we've uh, had a flurry of interviews. I think we've interviewed everybody in the K-League. Uh, we've got... <laughs> uh, Yesterday, we've had, uh, it was published on kleague.com, an interview with Seoul Elan's Kim In-sung. That was uh, mm -hmm. done by our very own Michael Redmond. Uh, we also have interviews on there with FC Anyang's Maxwell Acosti and Incheon's Stefan Magosa. Uh, we've got Branko Balan's Three Takeaways on K-League United. That comes out every week, and he takes a look back on each weekend and the things that, the talking points that, uh, well, shape the discussion on this podcast most of the time. Nathan Sartain has also been on the interview circuit. He's interviewed Kim Day Won from Gangwon. Uh, so you can read that. That one is over on K-League United. I hope you've got a pencil. I'm keeping track of all these, where they are. Uh, <laughs> um, and then Tom Mark Antonio, our Busan writer for many, many seasons. He's actually just written his final KOU piece asking whether or not it will be another year of med mediocrity for Busan Eye Park. So a nice uplifting tone for him to leave and perhaps not the uh, the article he would have liked to bow down on but it, it as always with tom it's it's a great read and i implore everybody to go and have a read of it and uh there's also we don't normally advertise the next podcast because normally we don't but the next podcast is quite a fun one uh we've got we've decided to turn the all g louise mailbag around uh for mm. a week and we've decided to ask some of our regulars some questions uh we'll be asking charlotte patterson uh, Bora, aka Suan FC fan, Spain, Clint Jones, aka the 94th minute, and Asri Furman. Names our regular listeners will be very familiar with from the mailbag. We interview them to find out what it is like to support K League from overseas via K League TV and other methods and why it resonates with them and why it's so appealing. And uh, yeah, so that's coming up next week, we believe. And <laughs> there's a lot of editing to be done. There's a lot of editing <laughs> on this one. You tell me. <laughs> yeah, Matthew hosted that one, so I have no idea when it's coming out. And I'll, I'm actually going to be listening to this just like everybody else is listening to it because mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything yet. Yeah, I kept this one completely uh, yeah, low key. Nobody, uh, nobody's heard anything of it, but it, it is. It's a really, really interesting piece, and I'm hoping uh, we can get it out over the international break. We we will. I have faith mm -hmm. in you, Matthew. Yeah. All right. Well, all of that is what to look forward to or to what to look for on the interwebs right now. And if you were on the interwebs last night looking for dodgy illegal feed streams or anything like that, or if you were here in Korea and you're lucky enough to watch on TV, then you caught some good matches. We won't be talking about Melbourne Victory's trip up to Japan where that finished 4-3 in favor of Vissel Kobe. What a match that one was. I was... Mm watching that one and, and covering that one, doing a little bit of work on the side there. And um, what a game that was and what madness it was having all three of these games going on at the same time for a little bit there. Daegu did kick off a little bit later, but our listeners won't be as concerned with those matches as they will be with Ulsan Hyundai's 3-0 victory over Port FC from the Thai League. And Matthew, this one, it was close for a while. Uh, uh, Chegi Yoon got his first mm -hmm. professional goal in pretty good fashion too. A nice little dink chip over the keeper. And it gave Ulsan the lead in the 13th minute. And I think that was really important for this one because for folks that don't know, Ulsan had a COVID outbreak in the squad and they were a very depleted side coming into this. How important was that early goal, do you think? Oh, very much so. Yeah, they had uh, 15 players unavailable mm. for this one, I believe. Oh, they had 15 available. I can't remember, but whatever it was, there was 
unrecognised centre backs, uh, but actually <laughs> midfielders at centre backs. Uh, yeah, it was a very, very depleted All Sun squad. So getting that early goal certainly shored things up a bit and uh, allowed them to perhaps not press as much, but they were still very attacking in their play. And that that came to fruition in the second half as well, late into the second half, where they bagged another two goals, one from uh, Omwon Sank, who, well, the assist was Leonardo, a lovely little chip over mm. the back line, and uh, Omwon Sang moving in to finish it. And then Omwon Sang, uh, he, well, he earned the penalty. He did get stretched off for his troubles, um, but Leonardo was there to convert the third. So 3-0 for Ulsan with a, mm-hmm. a very depleted squad. I mean, the questions are around how um, how many players they'll have available this weekend for the East Coast yeah. derby and whether that can actually go ahead because the K-League actually requires having more players in the squad than the AFC does. So it'll be int- it might be touch and go right up to kickoff to see uh, what kind of team they'll field for the weekend. But that's, that's next weekend. That's the weekend that's ahead. That's next weekend. Yeah, uh, Olsen, all, all very good performance from them, I thought. Yeah, for me, I think the, the two standouts here was that the squad was so depleted they had to put Park Ju Young in the lineup at long last. <laughs> and boy, did he Park Ju Young it up out there. And mm, anyway, but for me, and I, I know that Port is not doing well in the Thai League right now, that they are better off probably focusing on domestic matters than actually getting into the ACL right now. But I still think with everything at stake for Ulsan to go out there and win this one, I think is a statement for them. And it does show a little bit more squad depth than it seemed like they had. I mean, I think that's really going to be tested this weekend. Like you say, if they're even going to be able to play this match, it might be postponed. But I do think it was it was important for Ulsan to win this one, obviously. But I think it was important for them to win it by this kind of a scoreline as well even without their star players, some of their star players, I should say, because obviously Leonardo was quite the signing for them and has hit the ground running. But, I mean, no real surprise in the result there, which we'll talk about that in a second. But they do end up joining J-League champs Kawasaki Frontale, Guangzhou FC, as they're now known, and the perennial Malaysian champions Johor Dalrul Tazim in Group I of the AFC Champions League. And again, there are five groups out East now, same as last year, but mm-hmm. if you're still getting used to it, 40 teams. So tons of teams in there. And we'll, we'll give a full preview of that later, but what do you think of their chances in that group? Just from the off, Matthew. Well, Guangzhou FC are, are far from the force that they once were, uh, given all the stuff that's gone on with uh, their parent company and, uh, well, yeah, players not being paid, being on the transfer list, being released. Yeah, so yeah. Guangzhou FC, I, I wouldn't be too worried about uh, if I was a All Sun fan. Kawasaki Frontale, obviously, they're they're a known entity. They're always going to prove mm-hmm. difficult, and I've had the better of them in re- recent meetings, I believe. But um, they, it's, it's still a very, very difficult fixture there. And uh, yeah, Johor, obviously, they they've become more and more regular participants in this they're coming mm-hmm. into this competition on phase it's not it's not unfamiliar territory for them and they can certainly cause a headache of some teams so it's going to be a difficult group i think yeah. in some respects but yeah guangzhou is the uh, it's how how many goals everybody else can stick past guangzhou in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i still think all san will, will win it and win that group or at least oh. yeah no i, I oh. think I, I i still think their first team is better than Kawasaki, probably. I just think Ulsan's biggest issue is is their depth. I mean, clearly it wasn't last night. Fantastic mm-hmm. for them to show that they they can play these players, but that might be more... Um, yeah, their, their depth will probably come into play more in the league, I think. I think for this yeah, absolutely. competition, their, their first team should be able to handle those, those opponents. Yeah, and on the note of depth and being able to handle your opponents uh Daegu FC's match went to extra time and it looked like it was going to go all the way to pens and indeed it did but at one moment it looked like it wasn't going to go to pens because the first goal in this game came in the 119th minute which most of the time you would think is going to be the winner and that was Jonathan Bellingi who scored that one for Buriram and at as we have James McKeon saying on Facebook here, it seemed like the Buriram players just were celebrating away and forgot about the fact that Cecina was still playing this game. 
<laughs> and he went down to the other end. And uh, I mean, yeah, okay, if he scored any goal here, it would have been pretty great. But what a goal this was from him. A curled effort from just inside of the box, if I'm remembering correctly. There's a lot going on. And again, there are no replays. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it was, it, yeah, it was not only like an audacious shot really to have, but it was also the one two up to it. Like it, the, for a team that, you know, every they, this was their last chance of the game, I would not have been doing a back heel for the one two to let Cecilia get that shot away but I mean it, it, it gave him the space he needed and yeah he doesn't he just does what Cecina does and we, we've praised this player season after season on, on this podcast mm-hmm. we've praised him before this was a podcast he is an absolutely <laughs> fantastic player and you know in years to come he's going to be remembered like Dayan in terms of how much how important he is to this league yeah that's a really good comparison and that does lead to the next question which is where should we build his statue <laughs> uh, right next to one of Rika, I believe. I just have the two of them. <laughs> just is good a massive <laughs> bronzed Rika outside of the stadium. <laughs> yes, please. I will say that uh, as Mike Baston is saying on YouTube right now, Daegu were trying their hardest to repeat the cup final mm. catastrophe. And it really did look like it was going to go that way for a minute. But just like the cup final, they kept fighting their way back in. And in this one, they were able to keep their cool in penalties. I, you know, I I really wasn't sure. You felt like Daegu had the momentum, obviously, because they equalized with that ridiculous goal from Cecina. But pens are always a bit of a crapshoot. But Buduram just didn't, they didn't have the, the cool to keep it in them from the spot. I mean, it should be mentioned that Oh Sung Hoon did save a, a penalty to make up yeah. for a not great play on that goal. Um so some heroics from him, which you would expect from him mm-hmm. because he's class. But overall, uh, what do we what do we think of where these matches are being played? Do you think it's fair for the Korean sides to be hosting these games? I th- mm, it's a difficult one because we also condone a playoff system in the k-league too well maybe not i don't quite like it but there's a playoff system in the k-league too which always favors the higher seeded team and this is exactly mm-hmm. what's happening here in these playoffs it's one that favors the higher seeded team it's being played at the highest seeded team's ground i would like it to be on the uh, the other ground i'm sure we probably would have got more there would have been a lot of fans in the stadium for those two fixtures mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. thailand that's and a point I, I think it would have been far more difficult for both of those K-League sides, especially coming off, um, we've got K-League fixtures in the the weekends either way. And mm-hmm. yeah, it logistically would have been a bit difficult for them and perhaps would have affected the result a bit more. It would be more exciting if it was given to the lower seeded team, in my opinion, but I can understand why they want to reward the teams with the higher coefficients. Yeah. Especially over one leg, obviously two legs, it, it wouldn't matter at all, but. I, I, yeah, I still would love to see these hosted with the Mm -hmm. lower seed, but I I don't think we're going to anytime soon. But in the meantime, we do see Daegu FC making it consecutive group stage appearances, which is massive for a club that's in this competition for just the third time in their history to go back to back years in the group stage of the Champions League without winning silverware this time as well. So, I mean, it's just, it's a really impressive feat from them. And, And again, this club, we say it all the time. I think they're continuing to show the way forward for a lot of Korean clubs right now. And they have their work cut out for them in their group. They will be joining Chinese Super League champions Shandong Taishang, the two-time ACL winners Urawa Reds, and the Kim Shin Uk and Kim Do Hoon led Lion City Sailors. <laughs> and that's in Group F. That's going to be a fun group. Yeah, it could be quite evenly matched i am I'm, I'm always it's a bit difficult to kind of gauge what level the chinese super league teams will be at given all everything that's Fair. gone on in the last two years and um yeah sandong uh, taishan they've son jun ho former k-league mvp he's heard of him playing there yeah currently linked with the uh, southampton and fulham uh but yeah <laughs> he's He'll be one of the main threats for them, I guess. And but it's too. Your Reds will be perhaps the 
the team to be. I'm not going to say Lion City Sailors. I, I think Kim Shin How get a dare you not say nah, Lion City get, Sailors? They you should be fine in that group, I think. Mm -mm. I'm telling you, the Sailors, all hands on deck. They're the team to beat in that group. <laughs> We'll we'll talk about that in the weeks to come when we do our full on ACL preview. Yeah, and I'm sure when... Rich Rush on our eye will have many great things to say yeah. about Kim that, Chinook, that, who he's always we... loved. Yeah, that's when we we actually listen to other experts from other leagues and go, oh, actually, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a bit difficult mm. at the moment. We can just say what we like. Yeah, Daegu going to absolutely walk it. Yeah, um, no, we know you're saying doing... that. Yeah, we know these teams a little bit, but yeah, it'd be more interesting to hear what other league experts have to say about the chances which is what we'll be doing in a couple of weeks time but mm -hmm. in the meantime matthew and i are going to hop out for a little bit we're going to welcome paul in because what's a podcast without paul neat and he is going to be speaking with gangwon fc's dino Aslamovic. all that right after a quick break fnr is a revolutionary football dedicated digital platform the first of its kind in australia it provides a 24 7 live online radio platform experience podcast hub and acts as a content provider for tv radio and digital having reached millions of listeners and football fans since launching fnr is accessible worldwide via its website or app providing a platform to discuss debate and celebrate the world game we are your voice of football fnr football nation radio dino thank you very much for your time today how's it going yeah it's going good you very good, thank you very much. Yeah, um, let's let's just start with some very easy, quick fire, um, fun kind of questions. Yes. First, Messi or Ronaldo? Uh, Messi. Messi. Um, Ibrahimovic or Henrik Larsson? Ibrahimovic. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Tea or coffee? Uh, tea. Tea. Wine or beer? <laughs> Uh, I don't drink alcohol so much. So. Oh, really? Okay. I would say Fair wine. Fair enough. Though. Wine, okay. Uh, spicy food or salty food? Salty food. All right. Uh, cardio or weights? <laughs> None of it, but uh, I would say uh, uh, cardio probably. Cardio. Netflix or YouTube? Mm, YouTube. Uh, being a passenger or being a driver? Driver. Driver. All right. Um, who was your footballing hero when you were growing up? Well, I grew up in uh, Malmö, Sweden. So uh, Ibrahimovic was the biggest idol of, to be honest, me, me and all my friends. So, uh, yeah, Ibrahimovic was definitely. And he's still playing even at 40. Yeah, Incredible. It's unbelievable. Incredible, yeah. Unbelievable. All right. Um, and last of these little fun questions. Gang 1 FC were founded in what year? 2008. Hey, good. There we go. <laughs> All right. So, Dino, how's uh, how's life in Korea so far for you? Uh, yeah, actually, it's very good. Uh, above what I expected, to be honest. Um, it's been a nice transition for me. Uh, easier than what I thought. So, uh, no, I'm, I don't have uh, any complaints. Good. Has there been any culture shocks for you? Uh, not really. I'm quite used to moving around, uh, being in different clubs, different countries. But uh, obviously, this is a little bit further than what, what I'm used to. Uh, different language. Mostly people uh, don't speak English. Uh, but I think it's been all right. You know, I have my uh, translator with me. Uh, so he helps me a lot and uh, no, it's been, it's been very good. Good. How's the food? Did you know that Gangwon is an area is famous for potatoes? Yeah, I heard about it. Uh, yeah. The food is all right, actually. Uh, been out eating in different restaurants and it's been fantastic. It's a lot of the Korean barbecue and I'm a big fan of it. So, Yeah, well, uh, on the field, been a great start to you. A goal on your debut and a win. You must be very happy with how your debut went in particular. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you come in and you try to make an impact. Um, and yeah, I think I did that. Uh, so yeah, I think it's important to, to get a good start uh, for the team and for me. So 
uh, Canterbury. Yeah, more goals since then too. And um, obviously, as a striker joining a new club, do you put a pressure on yourself to score from the very beginning or, or something that you just think, okay, it might take time? Of course, you have pressure and you put the pressure on yourself. Uh, I think you have to understand yourself that it can take time. Uh, and sometimes you don't score the first five games and then you score for five games. Uh, for me, uh, I'm 28 now, so I, I've been through it, both scoring in the beginning and scoring in the end. So, uh, yeah, to be honest, I, I put pressure on myself, but I know how it works. Yeah. Um, so where did the move come from? Obviously, you spent most of your time in, in Europe. Where did the sudden move to Asia and uh, the K-League, where did that come from? Uh, well, I've been uh, two years in Norway. Uh, I had one year left in my contract and the uh, offer came and I felt like uh, I wanted to move. And uh, I think the K-League is, is a good league. Uh, so, uh, to be honest, I thought about a couple of days and... and after that, it was just to take a step. I think that you do good here and you can take uh, another step both in Europe and in Asia. So, uh, I mean, you you try to develop every day. So, for me, uh, it was quite easy choice. Yeah, we've already had some quite famous Montenegro internationals play in K-League. Obviously, Magosha and Dejan. Have yes. you, did you speak to either of those two uh, about what life's like here? Uh, not really, to be honest. Uh, I know that uh, when I've been in the national team, I spoke a little bit with uh, Mugosha about uh, the national team, well, uh, the Korean league, uh, not knowing that I'm, I will come here. Uh, so that's the only info I knew. Uh, but since I knew I was coming here, I, I didn't speak about uh, with them about it. Okay. How does um, K League One then compare to obviously the leagues you played to in the past? Obviously in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and in in Norway, in terms of the tempo and the style of play, that kind of thing. I think it's difficult to say. I try to compare, and to be honest, I spoke this with my friends. Uh, even spoke to one guy that plays in China, and it's, it's different. It's a different football. It's a different culture, and. Uh, but one thing I would say is that the football in K-League is very technical. I think uh, every individual player is, is a very uh, technical skilled. Uh, intensity is high. Uh, that, these two things, I would say, is the, is the most... Uh, what I've, I've seen is the most uh, highest quality, I think. Uh, then I think tactically, Europe is a little bit better. I think that's... that's uh, uh, area where where you should develop more yeah obviously you've um you played almost a full game in in the in the last game you have to sort of come off the bench a, li a little bit is that just down down to fitness or is it um because of the under 22 rule that kind of thing is that is that what it uh, is <laughs> you should ask the coach but I think <laughs> because of the fitness uh, i came from uh, straight from holiday uh, didn't really play a lot playing football for two months because uh, the league stopped in in the beginning of December in Norway. I came here in the beginning of February. So it takes time to get fitness and uh, not getting any stupid injuries if, if uh, I would start straight away. But I'm feeling better and better every week. And uh, I think it was a good plan to, to not overdo it. Uh, feeling, like I said, better and better every day. So uh, hopefully I will start uh, next Sunday. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously we talked about um, feeling the pressure maybe to score early on, but obviously Gangwon were one of the lowest scorers in, in K-League last year. Obviously they finished 11th. They had to go through a relegation playoff. You being the, 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 the number nine, obviously you wear the number nine shirt. You are the, the main striker. And obviously in, in the K-League, there aren't that many foreign players. So... Do, do you like having that expectations of, of being the guy to sort of fire them up, up the table and away from what happened last year? Of course. I mean, uh, there's a saying, uh, with pressure comes privilege. Uh, so uh, obviously it's a, it's a big pressure, but uh, I think the, the reward is bigger. If you, if you do well, uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing to do. And uh, I think uh, Gangwon, 
last year was was a bit unlucky with things I heard. Uh, I think it's a better team than playing in relegation. So uh, no, really, I think he's. Uh, I say uh, it's a pressure, but I like it. Yeah. What did you know about Gangwon FC then before you joined? Did did the the club really try and sell the the vision to you or the the you know the project and that kind of thing? <clears throat> well, um, like you said, it was a relegation battle last year, and uh, I think that uh, that they tried to explain that they were not that low normally and i think the new owner also trying to build like the new president trying to build something uh, uh, with a long-term plan and uh, obviously that i'm one of the stepping stones in that so um, yeah to be honest that was it i think the president's uh, name and uh, record speaks for itself uh, and uh, i think uh, the club shocked me in how professional they are uh, to be honest, you don't really know when you come from Europe how how it is here. Uh, but I've been uh, I've been surprised. To be honest, uh, everything around the club is 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 worked per uh, perfectly for me. Yeah, you seem to be uh, have a good partnership al already with Kim Dewan. Um You must be very pleased with how with how that's kind of blossomed even after just a few matches. Yeah, he's a fantastic player. Uh, I saw it straight away when when I came uh, to training camp. Uh, that good movement, good technique, uh, good finishing. So uh, yeah, I think uh, it will get better and better uh, during the season. And what's the coach like to work with? He's he's quite well known in K League for someone who likes foreign players. He, um, you know, every foreign player that I've spoken to always speaks very well about him. What's yeah. he like in terms of his communication and his, his uh, management and that kind of thing? Well, I think he's uh, demanding, very demanding. Uh, for me, I like it. Uh, I think he's uh, honest, uh, saying that if you like, he will give you credit if you do do well, and I think he will tell you that if you're not doing well. Uh, so uh, tactically, I think he's uh, quite uh, very good. Um, like what I said before about the league, that tactically can get better. I think he's one of them that is uh, very good tactically. Uh, so, uh, no, fantastic. I think uh, he's also been a striker. So I'm trying to learn things from uh, from uh, from him also. Um, so, yeah. Has uh, he or the club said anything about where they want to be in terms of a target for this season? Have they said... A specific target or is it just sort of take each game as, as it comes no, not specifically but uh, i would say that from my feeling of, of what I, i've seen and what i heard is that obviously we're trying to be better than last year um, but i think top top half if you call it like that uh, would be a good result and then for me like like you say also you take one game at a time and you're trying to win every game and I mean, obviously, if you win every game, you win the league. But I think your your goal should be to win every game, uh, the next game. So um, that's that's the goal, to be honest. Like you said. Yeah. And what about you as an individual, as a, a striker? Obviously, you want to score in every game that you play in, of 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 course. But yeah. do you set goals, uh, a target before the season of say fifteen goals or or, or something like like that? Well. Um, I used to. Uh, I think it's difficult here because I'm not sure, uh, like, what's a normal number for, for a striker in, in this league to score. Um, I also think this number will always change for me. So, like, if say now I didn't have a number, but say if I had a number beginning of the season and I have a good start, then obviously that number should go higher. And I think obviously after 10 games, you don't score, you should, maybe you have to lower that number. So, yeah. I think you have to adjust your goal uh, and the plan. Uh, so I don't have a number right now, but I think that during the season, I I'll probably will have it. Yeah. And with obviously looking at the the goals from the weekend just gone, obviously your goal came from a great counter-attack and a, a great run down, down the wing. With, yeah. with, with those kind of wide players, 
it must mm. be very good for you as a striker knowing that you're going to be able to get those kind of balls in if you just know where, where where to be of course of course and um, i think uh compared to my last club we have uh, well wing backs that's that has the right foot uh on the on the right side you understand what i mean so i left footed yeah. on left side and our right foot on the right side and uh obviously wingers now with the uh, right foot on the right side and uh, for me as a striker that helps a lot if you compare yeah. to a, a winger that goes inside and probably will try to shoot by himself or or play inside so of course it helps a lot it's quite a big squad as well that gang won it. It's obviously because they've got a B team and now you can have players from the B team go back and forth. Is that something that you've noticed that is a very, very big squad perhaps compared to other other clubs that you played for in the past? Yeah, I think I think uh, the difference here is, well, it depends. I think when I played for Fulham and also in Cloning, it was the same, but you work together with the second team and when you're missing players you just bring them up um i think when when i played in fulham it was not a big deal to train with the first team because if they needed players we were just training the, uh, besides them so we just went over to the other pitch so i think i'm used to it uh, i think it's a good thing i think often you should try train 11 against 11 and uh, then you need 22 players so i think it's a very good thing yeah, what was it like playing for a Fulham or playing in in their youth setup? Uh, how, how was that experience for you? I mean, it's a it's a fantastic experience for for a young young player, uh, and uh, I think I learned a lot. Um, small details about like to be technical, tactical, everything. Uh, obviously, you train with much better players than you are used to, uh, and you have to bring your level up every day also training with first team is the same like you see how how good they are uh, and um, it's a difference also being being that good and performing that good every day every week every month uh, so for me realizing that at a young age is, it was very important yeah was it hard to leave when you eventually did decide to leave <laughs> not really um, no I think uh, even even though I learned a lot, it was a difficult per period for me. I didn't play so much, uh, had some problems uh, in the club, uh, outside the club. So uh, for me, it was a good thing, uh, but I still learned a lot, and uh, I will not I will not take it back. I think. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Um, well, obviously, in the last game, it was uh, one shot, one goal. You can't ask much more than that, can you? To be honest, I'd rather have five shots and one goal. Uh, yeah. So, uh, no, I I think it was a good game for me and for the team. I think uh, can do better than that. I can do better than that. Uh, create more chances. Because uh, I think you can see also when, when we scored 1-0, we played much more relaxed. And uh, obviously that's normal, but I think for, for us that last year was in a rele relegation battle and uh, I think we still have this uh, I don't know it's nervousness or what it is but uh, I think with winning games we'll get much better and uh, getting getting this confidence in the group and uh, in the club also because I think uh, now I've been in in different clubs uh, winning losing and you you realize how much a win can can mean for a club the, the energy during the week, during training, during just eating lunch and uh, in the clubhouse that you feel that that positive vibe. Uh, so I think we, we we can still get much better. I think we had a good start. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited for this season. Very good. All right. Well, Dino, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us. Good luck this weekend thank and good luck for the rest of the season. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Fans, we want to hear from you. You're encouraged to email KLU at info at kleagueunited.com or tweet at kleagueunited with any questions, comments or reactions. Or ask directly during one of our live shows.
Welcome back to the K-League United Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Walters, and I am back joined by Matthew Binns to talk about the most important team in the Jola province, and that is the Jenham Dragons. <laughs> and they have three minutes left with a narrow lead over league-leading Buchan FC 1995. But Matthew, I feel like there's another Jola team that's on your mind these days. Yeah, it's uh, it's not been the, the best of starts over in Jonju this season. A, a bit of an unfamiliar-looking K-League t- table at the moment with John Book in 11th after... 11th? Five rounds. Well, we, we're still not as bad as Song now, which is always good to know. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, those are historically the two most successful clubs I was thinking in that, league history. Yeah. How yeah. many trophies of in K League history are currently, you know, how or just sixteen? How much silverware? Well, yes, I was going to say how much silverware as well. Like how many? It's, it's oh ACL FA yeah, Cups, all that. So much history just currently confined to the uh, the bottom two. But it is early days. I, like all of all of this comes with you know a pinch of salt. Like it's True. round five. We know we know John Book uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, always kick into gear later down the line, but even by they their do. standards, it's still very a very unfamiliar um, start to the season for John Book. I think. Um, yeah, I think to lose three straight at any point is always mm-hmm. going to be a surprise for John Book. But I think, especially to lose three straight without scoring a goal, is <laughs> shocking from them i mean losing three okay that happens in k-league to most teams again not to jump book very often but to lose three straight without scoring a goal for jump book hyundai motors like what well okay okay we have a we have a little mailbag dip before i get into my questions for you because i got a lot of questions for you here matthew Mm -hmm. Uh, we do have an early mailbag dip from one scott whitelock and he's asking if you are mentally prepared for a relegation scrap. As I've already said, I'm going to musicals instead of watching this. Uh, no. <laughs> I, am... I mean, as as a Jumbo and Man City fan, you are aware of what relegation is. I right? am aware of what relegation is. Okay. It's it's that thing that happens to. Uh... <laughs> no, yes, I am. I have. I've had <laughs> suffered. I've suffered it. It's been a while. I have suffered mm-hmm. relegation. Mm-hmm. Um, I might have to. Yeah, relive some childhood memories i guess but yeah no um, the 90s were a long time ago man <laughs> yeah so uh no it's it's um, it, i'll i'll be very surprised if they're still there and i will fully expect everybody to be hashtagging relegate john book because i definitely definitely enjoyed it when soul was in a position so i'm, <laughs> I'm fully expecting to get all the stick back if that was to occur with Jumbo. but i don't think it's going to happen but they do have a problem with goals as you mentioned they just can't score it's it, yeah, what's going on there well i mean last season they've got they had two of the top four scorers in gustavo and Ilyachenko, and um mm-hmm. neither can find the net gustavo in all fairness he's currently got a back injury um didn't uh-huh. just, he did play the first couple of games made a few appearances but he's, he's not actually fit at the moment um we noticed it last season there was that stat going around we mentioned on this podcast that how few shots john book take to actually how many mm-hmm. score now they were Mm-hmm. They scored the most in the league last season, but they, they were, didn't rank very highly for shots taken. I think it was about seventh in the end. It, it came up quite a bit from the 11th place it was. But they, on top of that, they, they've only ever, last season, they only had one goal that was scored from outside the penalty area. And that was a, a free kick by Peck Song Oh. So they scored all those goals from inside inside the box. And I guess that's kind of where it's been leading with John, but they've been trying to create scorable opportunities which sounds very nice it can be very frustrating to watch though because instead of playing that cross or instead of taking that gamble they keep trying to find a way in and teams have got Mm -hmm. become accustomed to it you will look at Jeju at the weekend Jeju had quite a lot of players back in the box and it one thing Kim Sang-shik has been very consistent with what he actually played last season to this season the biggest difference is uh, or why Scout defines it as a smart pass so what that means mm-hmm. is a ball that breaks the back line uh, to create sure. an attack in play. John Book have averaged two a game. <laughs> they can't break down back lines. So they're trying to play this passing football, this well, it's pointless possession. It's like somebody has told them, with Salman City do it. 
This is how you know. This is how the best teams in the world do it. We should pass <laughs> uh-huh. them to death. And they, they they believe in their own old hype. They they believe in their own. Um, yeah, they, they think that they can just keep passing, and you know, you keep winning things, and it keeps adding proof that oh, this must be working. But it, it's really not. Now, I think one interesting stat that I. I I've been keeping. I've been keeping basically a hard copy of Y Scout for John Book, because <laughs> one day I'll, I'll figure something to do with these stats. But one uh-huh. thing that interests me is Che Kang Yee as manager um, for his last five seasons. Anyway, uh, he his teams averaged fifty percent possession. They didn't dominate. They, they edged it every now and then, but they didn't dominate possession. Uh, the majority of their passes were forward passes. And they were far. They played far more counter-attacking football. Uh, they, in fact, there was like a lot of in 2016. There was like lots of comparisons to calling Real John uh, Bayern John Book rather. And mm-hmm. Actually, they were closer to Dortmund, Klopp's Dortmund, in terms of pressing play as ca- uh, catching them on the attack and just running forward uh, teams. Now, Jose Moraes came in, and the average possession of the game was what shot up five percent. So it's now 55% of the game, which, and then you look at the actual directions of the passes and the main direction of the passes are lateral. They're all going sideways. <laughs> They've stopped playing forward passes so much. Mm-hmm. And Kim Sang-shik has kind of followed in the tradition of Jose Moraes. Now, he, Kim Sang-shik was well, like, hyped up by Che kang and Jose Moraes came in for two years while Kim Sang-shik got those coaching badges. You wonder mm. who who influenced who, to be honest, uh, during Jose Moraes' reign. Um, yeah, but yeah, well, certainly it's it's not working now. Now, Kim Sang-shik's aware of their tactical flaws. They've uh, actually hired a tactical coach this season. It's the uh, the same as the B side t- manager. That's Park Jin Sop. Um, <laughs> Because his tactics were spot on when he was in charge of FC Seoul. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I don't want to just judge him on FC Seoul because what he did with Guangzhou was really, really good. And if he could replicate sure. that, then, you know. But the, 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 another interesting thing is the tactical manager. But I've I've also decided to suffer double punishment these last few weekends by also watching the B team every week. And they're, they're barely playing. They're not playing the same tactics as the A, t- uh, as the A oh. team. Well... They are and they're not. They're getting far more rubber the green because it's K4 League, but they actually, they've only scored one goal in three matches. Uh, a 91st minute winner against Daegu B last weekend to get their first points of the season. Um, they're, they're averaging 60% of game possession, of, but they're actually attacking a bit more and they they don't move sure. the same way as Kim Sang-shik's John Book are. Kim Sang-shik's John Book are very slow and tedious in their build-up. The B team is actually attacking. It's just it's not winning at the moment, but they they look quite good against Daegubi at the weekend. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of the B team, I'm I'm curious because you, you've covered the tactical side of things and, and why the goals aren't coming. And yeah, the midfield has also just been really slow in transition. Everything's just been slow, right? Yeah. And so uh, we heard Paul bring this up with Dino in that interview, talking about the B squads and and the perks there. And like this is one where I think. If Ulsan had a B squad right now, that would be very handy for them, for example. Mm-hmm. But speaking of the the B squads that are here, is are there some options for Jumbook there to kind of switch things up and bring some players up from the B squad? Especially as may have been noted, as I'm sure you know, there really aren't many center backs <laughs> to speak oh, yeah. of on this team, which yeah, is absurd. Yeah, I mean, for Jumbo, like, what, 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 what's, that, what's, yeah. what's going on there? I mean, well, I can dress, well, I'll address the B team and then I'll address the centre back okay. issue because, yeah, like the B team, it was it's a youth team for John Book. They've they've had a massive youth intake. They signed another youth player yesterday. In fact, they just keep signing youth players and they're trying to put them into the B team. They did have a very big problem with the under twenty two rule last season. They still are struggling to find an under under twenty two player that's going to be a regular. Uh, they just tend to play the under twenty two players out on the wing for a short amount of time and then take them off. Um, usually for Min Son Min, who's usually the best player each week because he hasn't seemed to have got the memo. The rest of the, the team, <laughs> the rest of the team has. Um, but yeah, not yet, not yet. There's it's lots of promising young talents, but that's what they are. They're young, they're untested. They mm-hmm. do need far more experience before we can start considering them as um, potential players for John Book's senior side. But yeah, talking of centre backs, 
all through the transfer window, it's been John Book are looking for a centre back. Nobody seemed to explain why he didn't want to keep Kim Min Hyuk because Kim Min Hyuk is the, well the second best centre back because Hong Jong Ho is obviously very very good, but Kim Min Hyuk is brilliant centre back. Yeah, and, and has been for a long I, time. I feel that he probably, I mean, to leave for Song Nam, I feel that he probably felt that he wasn't going to get he wasn't getting the game time he deserved. But uh, Kim Sang Shik quite likes Koo Jae Rong. I don't know why. Um, Koo Jae Rong has seemed to has been culpable a number of times this season. He's been caught dead on his feet as well. Um, they have brought in Park Tin Sop, not the PT manager, but also the uh, the. The dead on uh, <laughs> midfielder, but can play yes. centre back. So we saw we've been playing him at centre back. He's a good talent. He's a very good talent at dead on. It's also early days for him, and he hasn't played centre back that much. I think twice so far this season. So he needs more time there. But even now, there's transfer rumours that they're trying to get in two more players before the deadline. They're trying to get in um, Kim Min Hwan from LAFC, and they're trying to get Kim Jin Kyu from. Uh, Boost and I Park, I, 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 I'm quite clear. Well, a bit odd to me, rather, should I say, that neither of them are centre backs. So, also, big... neither one really addresses an area of need at all. No, no. I mean, Eong is obviously he can't play as many games as he would. He's currently injured sure. at the moment. Yeah, but we've got Yu Hyun. I mean, he's also injured at the moment. There's about six weeks left on him. So perhaps it is just we need a we need a right back. But Taecho Sun can do a decent job there. Kim Jin Kyu, I don't know where he fits in. <laughs> <laughs> we got so many midfielders. I was like, this is just because we can get him. I think it's. I don't really. Yeah. He's a very talented player, and I'm sure that yes. he'll command game time. But so do all the other players in that team. It's a bloated squad at the moment, basically, and I, they, it, it, it's a very talented squad. And I'm sure as the season schedule gets busier, we're going to start seeing the benefits of that squad. Um, but at the moment, it is very, very worrying that the manager can't seem to get anything out of this team. Yeah, indeed. Cause like you say, the talent is there and I got three rapid fire questions for you. Cause I'm aware that we're, we're, we're mm, getting up yeah. to about the mailbag time here. So I got three rapid questions for you. One came in from James on Facebook and he's asking is Modu Barrow still on Jumbook? He is in quarantine at the moment. Yes. He's on Jumbook's books, but he had an extended uh, holiday because of the Africa cup of nations. Uh, he's now in Korea. Uh, he's in quarantine and, could do with him back soon. <laughs> right. And, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. We just had another one come in from Mike on YouTube asking Has Kim Moon Hwan come back to put himself in the shop window for the World Cup squad? If he gets game time, I mean, he certainly, <laughs> well, perhaps Lee Young would still be first choice, but Kim Moon Hwan certainly is going to come in game time at John Book. So, yeah, perhaps. It's a World Cup year. He wasn't yeah. exactly getting what he wanted at LAFC. So come back. No, especially John Book. with Bob Bradley leaving, mm -hmm. I think, a new manager in there this year. That was always going to be difficult for him. Uh, the last of the quick fire questions then is, should Kim Sang-shik stay as the manager? I can't do this on rapid fire. I Yes or no? If it doesn't change then he shouldn't stay. But I still believe that there is something there, but it's not taking hold at the moment. But You, you sound so convinced. I just... I, I wanted it to work with Kim Sang-shik. Mm -hmm. I really did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why I'm a bit reluctant. But I think... I don't want him getting thrown on the scrap heap and then never being employed by... K League teams again because he, he has got something to offer K League, I think, but, but perhaps the John Book job is just a job too soon for him. And um, yeah, if he if he was to leave John Book, and it'd be very sad if he did leave John Book given his history in the coaching staff, given his mm -hmm. history as a player, being the first captain to lift the K League trophy for John Book, it'd be very sad for him to then have to be pushed out the door. But I don't know at the moment whether it's a job too soon for him. Just that one title in his first year to wipe his tears with. Some so, dance moves as well. Some dance moves indeed. On that note, we're going to take a really quick break and we'll be back for a yeah, pretty full Old G. Luis mailbag. We'll be right back.
Uji Lewis is your neighborhood British bar and cafe located in the old Giro district of Seoul. Decorated in old English antiques and furniture for a true homely feel, you can enjoy homemade scones, cakes and afternoon tea during the day, and traditional British favorites like beef stew, English ale, and a fine selection of wines at night. Available for private parties or simply an evening out, Old G. Lewis is sure to become your favorite neighborhood pub. Be sure to mention K-League United at the bar during your visit and you'll get 10% off your bill. Welcome back to the K-League United podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Walters, joined in the Old G. Lewis mailbag by Matthew Bins. Hello. And I'm uh, I'm going straight into the mailbag. Yes, right. Okay, <laughs> that's that's the plan. That's what we do in this segment. We do, we do. It's been a while since we've done a podcast, though. I realised, so <laughs> I'm a bit out of practice. Uh, but yeah, into the old <laughs> smooth as ever. It's always it's always the commercial been smooth, is right? old Louis. Yeah. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got Bora or someone FC fan Spain, and he's coming with a question saying, which K League team do you think will advance the most rounds in the ACL? Ooh, I mean, obviously the John Dragons because they're going to win it. Mm-hmm. So, no, no K two t- side has ever played in Champions League before, and they will also become the first K two side to win Champions League. Mm. And it, it, I mean, honestly, though, of all the groups, I think Group G, the one the Dragons are in with BG Potham, Thai champs. United City, Philippines champs, and Melbourne City, Australian champs. It's not that terrible of a group. I think it's a pretty even group for the most part. And the Dragons scored two goals again tonight, so they've proven that they can score goals. So I think they'll be all right. But uh, I do think of the K-League teams, I think this could be an area where Jumbo could turn things around. I think... ACL is what got them going last year, like really properly got them going. I think ACL might be where they find their groove this year. They are in a pretty tough group, though. They have Yokohama, uh, Hong An Gilai. I need to figure out how to pronounce that properly for the show. Oh, sorry. And Sydney FC. That's a tough group. That's a tough group for them. Yeah, I... I actually, I think John Buck is absolutely murdered by your colleagues, to be honest. I think they're absolutely slaughtered if, yeah. they haven't, if they haven't addressed these issues by then. But I think they, they should get enough points against the other two to find a way through the group, I believe. But to mm-hmm. answer the question, I, I still think all some. I, yeah, they may they may tire, but it's a it's a very long tournament this year. You know, they could get reinforcements in the summer as well, and I, I do think they're going through that group. So I, I think all some are going to. Go and you know what? I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to say ACL is where we see Park Chi Young score a goal. <laughs> no, let's not get ahead of ourselves for uh, the right. first time in like 30 <laughs> years. Uh, uh, James Edrupt is Perez leading the sack race? Ooh. I mean, in K2, yeah, in K2, I think so, mm-hmm. but I mean. It, it, it's hard to keep looking past what Kim Nam Il isn't doing with Song Nam. I mean, uh, how long are you going to keep dealing with being in that position? And it, it, it's not like they don't have some decent players. And, and Kim Young guan has been really good for them between the sticks forever. I mean, apparently that man just doesn't age, which is amazing. Um, but I mean, when you've got a reliable keeper, and, and you've got some talented center backs there as well. You know, we were just talking about Kim Min-hyuk. Should be doing better than that. And, and, and to me, I think a lot of it is just this don't lose mentality that he puts into the team every single game. Some of them are not fun to watch, man. They, they mm-hmm. are not a fun team to watch in the slightest. And sure, maybe they're not fun to play against. But when you're finishing in the relegation scrap every single year, it, switch something up. So, I mean, yeah, Perez probably got a pretty short rope with Busan because uh, Busan's another talented team. But for me, uh, how how long are you going to keep doing this, Song Nam? Come mm-hmm. on. Yeah, I, I think uh, Kim Nam would be my my 
pick. Uh, the reason why I'd also say Perez, he might not get the sack just yet. It's just because Busan are kind of going for a philosophy. It's like John Book, they have this overarching philosophy. Busan, when they went down, they decided we're going to, you know, they're going to try and incorporate more youth players. And Perez was, because Busan have links, don't they? They're, they're president, um, uh, well, the KFA president, Tung Mongu, he's linked with Busan I Park as well. And <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah he, he, he wanted, he, you know, he, Perez was picked with suggestion from Bento and it was kind of going to be bringing through these youth players. And you see, like he played seven under 22 youth players. I nicked that from Tom's article, which you can read on the website there. Uh, but yeah, he, he's playing lots of youth players. I don't think he's a manager to get the most out of them. <laughs> but I think as long as Bento is still with the national team, and there's those links. I still feel that he's probably got a bit of slack, really, when it comes to getting sack. We'll see what happens. I, I mean, I, is evident the evidence on the pitch says to me that it, <laughs> they should be considering it. But yeah. it depends how much all uh, all son. Ooh, that's a Freudian. Isn't it? it depends how much Busan have subscribed <laughs> to that that youth only policy. If they if they've really subscribed sure. to that. And if he's doing what they want, then anyway, who am I to know? Should point out they are currently losing 1 0 to FC Anyang as we record this. Yeah. A, a, ten, a 10 man FC Anyang. <laughs> Might have so, your answer. But... Anyang scored the goal before they got down to 10 men. Yeah. But... I, I do think there's, there has been some controversy with him and the fans in recent weeks as well. Like mm -hmm. the team. The, so I think. If anything, that might add sway to him potentially going or definitely going to put him under more pressure. But we'll see definitely Song Nam, uh, Kim Nam Il, to, for me, yeah. who's in the most danger. Uh, we do have a question in from the John Buck Hyundai fan account saying, I know it's early in the season, but Gimpo have looked decent. How big mm. do you think the gap between K3 and K League 2 is? I think this is a really interesting case study this year because... Essentially, this was promotion. As we've mentioned before, Gimpo won K3 last year. So in a lot of ways, this was a, a, a righteous, a righteous, <laughs> a rightful promotion and a righteous one, I guess. <laughs> Why not? I'm reading Good Omens at the moment, finally. Yeah. Huge Neil Gaiman fan. This has just been a blind spot for me. So I'm reading Good Omens right now. So I think that's where that one's coming in. Anyway, uh, yeah, they were the rightful winners of k3 and, and earned promotion that's not technically how they got it but sure um and it's interesting to see this team that's built based on that built based as if they were promoted having earned it and and they're they're they've started really really well and i think this speaks to what we've seen in the fa cup which suggests that k3 really isn't very far behind k2 at all and in a lot of ways i think it's very similar so we've talked about the gap between K1 and K2. I think you take the bottom four or even five sides in K1 and the top three or four teams in K2, they pretty similar, you know? And I think that Gimpo is proving that that could be the case with K3, which I'm really happy to see. And I really, you know, I didn't predict them super high in my league table, but I'd love to be wrong about that because I think the indication then is that that gap isn't too big. And then we could see the pyramid really truly open up. And then those K3 teams won't be as scared or, or as hesitant to, to try to make a push into K2 and then maybe even into K1. I mean, how great would it be if we saw a team like Gimpo, not this season because this is the season the Dragons need to get promoted, but what if we saw them come from K3 to K2 to K1? I mean, that that's a great story. I'd love to mm -hmm. see that. Yeah, I fully agree. I, I think... Having these teams that can prove that they can make the step up is only going to encourage more to do it and eventually encourage that opening up, which we are all waiting for. Uh, uh, we, right. We mm -hmm. did get one more that just came in uh, on Facebook. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, the air is thick down here. Asking if Ulsan can be uh, the champions this year in ACL. Or not. Yeah, I mean, they, they might be champ very well be champions in K League by the end of it. Um, we'll see. I, I say that every season, and I get it getting in early now to get John Book to prove me wrong. Uh, but Champions League, yeah, it's going to be. 
I think they might do all right in the East Zone, which I think is one of the follow-up comments there. I think they will do all right in the East Zone. It's when it gets to the final, it could be could be quite difficult. It's, but yep, yeah, I, I still yeah think they'll go quite far. I think the J League sides are probably their biggest threat. Yeah. Nothing new there, really. Um, mm. Or Pohang. Oh, they're not in it. Oh, they're all right then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... hey, John Nam. Hey, they don't like Posco clubs. John Nam. John Nam. Uh, that's a semi final we'll we're all waiting for. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. No, actually. But, I mean, if it does happen, we have beat Ulsan in a semi final recently. No mm. big deal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we do. And this last one. <laughs> Uh, we do have one more in, and Go uh, on. yeah, well, okay, we uh, we were talking like things we can do, let's say, and we're, Paul, Paul put it out there, mm-hmm. Paul, uh, like maybe the influenced know. by the musical, yeah, p- p- maybe influenced by the musical stuff. He, he wants to, uh, just giving us some fan chants, uh, fit, squeezing in. Uh, Dejon, like, well, for him, squeezing in Dejon players into songs. And we thought, mm-hmm. well, we'd quite like other people to get them in as well, you know. So we're going to use, uh, for the next few weeks, we'll do it for a month or something, see if we get people in. But yeah, we're going to use, like, hashtag Kaylee Karaoke, I think, because that's something we have used in the past. We'll just revive that. Hashtag Kaylee Karaoke. We want to just hear, trying to get players into into English songs. I, I personally Takehiro Kunimoto to the tune of Loco in Acapulco and um, <laughs> Nam Kiela Queen, uh, Nam Kiela Team to the tune of Killer Queen. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some good ones in there. But uh, anyway, Paul, <laughs> maybe maybe not ready to um, this is how technical we are. Paul has sent me a voice note and we're just going to play it. So we've got an audible mailbag <laughs> this week. So brace yourselves, everyone. And uh, yeah, Paul won't be showing his face for a while, Pat. I'm your biggest fan. I'll follow you until you love me. Masa, Masa Toshi. In Dejan, there's no other superstar. You know that I'll sing. Masa, Masa Toshi. I like it. You don't have to send it. Fans can send in. You can send in mm. your own audio clips. Nice. I'll, I'll play them all day. And we'll play them play them in a more, more professional manner we've done there but yeah so please said you know you can send in hashtag kaylee karaoke we're going to try that out for a couple of weeks and just have a bit of fun with it i will say that uh, i mean the two things i would say on this is it you know, obviously we know it should be noribong but kaylee karaoke just has such great alliteration that oh yeah gotta go with that and speaking about noribong which for those that don't live in korea or know korean that's the private singing rooms the the private karaoke as you might know it uh, and that's what it is here in Korea. But I have actually seen Matthew Bins get a perfect 100 score singing Team of Kim Chinooks to the tune of uh, Yellow Submarine. So, yeah, well, what can I say? It was, uh, it was it, they're there. They're there for the taking. We'll they're put some up on social. I have heard myself sing. I don't want the rest of the world to hear me sing. So I don't know if I'll be having any of them out there, but do please get those in because, oh, I would love to see yeah. some of those. Those uh, would be great. So again, we'll get some of those up on social. Are there any other audible mailbags, Matthew? There's no more audible, audible, automobile, automobile. There's no more audible mailbags. <laughs> oh man, we are on fire. Uh, yeah. We can't take this long off of a live show again, apparently. No. We've managed to do an hour and eight minutes as well. We're doing for, we're doing for flying, but yeah, that is we're going to end the mailbag there with uh, Paul okay. singing. But yeah, well done to Paul for being a good sport with that one as well. You, you know, fair enough. Um, Indeed. But yeah, get your you you can just write the lyrics. You don't need to uh, to sing. Please sing if you want, though. It'd be great, right? And uh, yeah, that's it. Excellent. Well, if you would like to become more involved with what we do around here, then you can do so over on Patreon. And we have a bunch of patrons to thank. Again, we won't be able to get to absolutely everybody this week, but we are giving some shout outs this week to Josh Shaw, Harry Brooks, Stelez. Uh, I don't know if that's a part and part. You don't have to have your actual name on Patreon. Maybe that is actual name. I don't know. Anyway, Indovina Kip, Anze Rus, Jared TV. Wow, I hope TV is actually somewhere in their name. Mario, just one name there. Julian Rodin, Mark Hodgson, Calandre Andres In, not Andres Iniesta, maybe though. Could you imagine if he's one of our patrons? Mm. He's just trying to get 
He's getting that injury news on K League players. Uh, Jonathan Gui, Colin Fawes, and Matt Fisher. Thank you all so much for joining Patreon. And for those of you that uh, that we haven't been able to thank personally yet, we are getting to you. We will get to you next week. But Matthew, if, if folks want to join and they want me to, they want to have me butcher their name on the podcast here. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that they could get? Well, at one dollar tier, the K three Champions tier. You uh, get to join in our weekly discussion thread. We'll uh, get them going. Every weekend, we just have a discussion thread for people to uh, just talk about what they've seen. You'll get the podcast rundowns uh, when they're ready in time. And you'll get the K-League Survivor entry. Well, when it's when it was uh, available, we are going to be doing another game in the summer. So that will also be at the $1 tier. So please sign up for that. You get to enter the $1 tier. And if you, you know. Next year, you can also do the K-League Survivor as well. But K-League Survivor is back. We'll come to that in a second. K2 Champion Tier, that's $3. You get long read articles, monthly stat pieces, videos, pod extras, uh, behind the scenes, team sheets. Yeah, you get you get lots of things in that one. That's one for the fans there. So $3 a month for that. And then we also have the K1 Champion Tier, $5 a month. Uh, this is for your injury news and Team notes for all 12 K-League 1 teams every Thursday. You also get a, exclusive access to a weekly question and answer thread uh, where our columnists will all give try our best to find the answers to your questions about certain players. And you can also request which stats we dive into for our written mm -hmm. posts as well. So that's at $5 a month there. That's right. And coming up very soon, you'll be hearing us on FNR, Football Nation Radio, down in Australia as we preview AFC Champions League with them. We will also have a couple of them be guests on our ACL preview show, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a couple of very fun things lined up for that one. So if you don't want to miss that, do please subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you get your podcast and leave us a review, five stars preferred, and we'll be your best friend forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who says podcasters aren't your friends? Not us, because we'll be your best friends. And speaking of making friends, Matthew, I'm hoping that's what will happen with the team that I pick in Survivor. We're going to end this week by uh, giving our Survivor picks while we still have lives. I'm down to my last life because... Because... Uh, how many lives do you have left in Survivor right now? Two lives. I'm doing all right. I had that one bad oh, okay. week. But, Who uh, burned I'm, you? Uh, I don't remember now. It's been so long. <laughs> it's been like three weeks. It wasn't John Book, but it, it could very well have been. But I haven't picked that. I'm not picking them. Don't pick John Book. That's the one thing I've decided on. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, don't pick them. I don't know who to pick, to be honest. I think um, I'm going to dabble in K League One. I've been dabbling in K League Two for the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay. So let's just have a look at these K League Two, K League One fixtures right here. And I am going to go for. This is. Is this the this amount of research great. you put into it every this week? Amount, this is the amount of research I put into it every week. And I am going to go with Daegu to not lose to Suwon FC. So that's three points Almost, for Suwon FC yeah. this weekend. Yeah, that's in Suwon this weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, oh, also, uh, bad news for Daegu fans. Uh, Edgar ruptured his Achilles. So. He is oh, gonna yes. be out. I know he for went off. A while. I... Yeah, he went out and he went off in the game last night, which is unfortunate. That's his former club, obviously. He used to play for Budiram and well, scored a goal against Jumbuk while playing for Budiram. But um obviously we wish him a speedy recovery mm -hmm. as well. I, I hate the fact that we've had to mention two ruptured Achilles in this uh, in this podcast, but he won't be there for that one. So uh, I don't know. I feel like Daegu's gonna have a bit of a hangover. So I wasn't feeling as sure about that one. What I am feeling sure about is Seoul Eland getting a home not loss. <laughs> a home not loss is what I'm going to call it because I don't want to say win and curse them. A home not loss against Chungnam Asan. I feel pretty good about that one. So Seoul New Eland is my pick. Well. New home ground for Seoul. That's right. Uh, Mokong. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yep. Still south of the river but mm -hmm. now on the west side where FC Seoul also plays. So a bit strange, a bit strange. But anyway, those are our picks for Survivor. And we'd love to see who you folks are picking this week. So if you haven't got those in, go ahead and get those in. But anyway, in the meantime, for Matthew Benz, I'm Ryan Walters. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to
さん、東京本拠地、キッシル。